Good afternoon and welcome to another installment of the ARA's webinar presentation series. I'm Robert Wilson, General Manager of Workforce Development here at the ARA. Today I'm very pleased to introduce Mr. Ravi Ravatharan, Director of the Institute of Railway Technology at Monash University. Ravi has 30 years of experience in railway research. From 2006 to 2008, he was the National Executive Chairman of Engineers Australia's Railway Technical Society of Australasia. The RTSA conferred life membership to Ravi in 2011 and a coveted RTSA Individual Award in 2014 for his outstanding contribution to the Australian and international rail industry. Ravi was awarded the prestigious Australian in Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering's Clooney Ross Award in 2014 for the application of science and technology for the benefit of Australia. Ravi is a Fellow of Engineers Australia, Chartered Professional Engineer and Engineering Executive. He is also an Advisory Board Member of Industrial Transformation Training Centre for Advanced Technologies in Rail Track Infrastructure in Australia and a member of the Rail Knowledge Bank Advisory Group. Today, Ravi will be presenting on the topic of proactively managing a net rail network in the 21st century. <clears throat> we have allowed plenty of time for questions at the end of Ravi's presentation. Please post your questions throughout the presentation by clicking the dark blue hand icon in the top right corner of your screen. <clears throat> Today's presentation slides are available to download. Just click the light blue down arrow resources icon in the top right corner of your screen. This presentation is also being recorded and a link will be shared in the coming days. We are live, so if you do experience any technical issues during the webinar, please contact the Redback support team whose number is listed at the bottom of your page. And with that, I'd now like to welcome Ravi to the screen for his presentation. Thank you very much, Robert. It's an interesting uh, presentation today on proactively managing a rail network in the 21st century during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic situation. Um, I have structured my presentation in the following segments, initially setting the theme and then providing a brief introduction to Monash Institute of Railway Technology and then going through challenges with managing a rail network and the system approach technological solutions, some of the technological solutions to meet 21st century demands, and then proactive approaches, uh, highlighting some of those benefits and summarizing my presentation. As Robert said, I think um, I would like to uh, do this presentation in the next uh, 45 minutes, and I will see how the timing goes as this is my first uh, webinar presentation. So um, rail network in the 21st century, there are quite a few interesting phenomena. First of all, there is a significant demand in rail transportation, and therefore there are significant investment has been highlighted in the next 15 years in the order of $150 billion. This is to see how we can increase our throughput, and therefore also that implies that there is a diminishing maintenance window related to all our rail network. We all know who are in the railway industry, there is a lack of human resources, and that brings in a significant challenge for a, a railway which is uh, quite conservative, quite a risk averse um, industry. In addition to that, there is an um, increased commuter uh, expectation and management expectation to manage the railways and provide the service that is demanded by the commuters. So uh, um, Monash Institute of Railway Technology is part of the uh, uh, Monash uh, University, which is the largest university in Australia. Um, I would like to acknowledge the people of Kulin Nation uh, on whose land uh, Monash is situated, and uh, we pay our respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging at this stage. And at Monash, we also are committed to diversity and inclusion. And Monash being the top ranked university, not only in Australia, around the world, it has got several platforms. And one of the platform, which is related to the railways, is called Monash Institute of Railway Technology. This is a, a photo of uh, Monash 
uh, engineering faculty um, outside my engineering faculty as you can see the largest uh, bogey or largest capacity bogey is uh, situated there and with IRT coming originally from the heavy haul um, research environment at, at BHP Melbourne Research Laboratory in, which, where we started in 1972 and moved on to Monash uh, um, in year 2000 and in a short time of 16 years it became the was it was identified as the premier track and vehicle research center in Australia um, now we are in 2020 and um, in the last 20 years we have established significant technical partnerships with the railway industry and uh, we provide uh, technical assistance to world uh, benchmark rail, heavy haul railway operations and some of the leading mass transit railways as well. The, the footprint of Monash Institute of Railway Technology spans over 19 countries. And in the last 20 years at Monash, we have worked with 160 enterprise partners and completed more than 500 projects. Currently at Monash, apart from Institute of Railway Technology, there are several uh, academics who are also linked to railway research activities and that now spans over 85 personnel working in railway at Monash. And some of the world leading technologies, uh, groundbreaking technologies have been developed through uh, Monash Institute of Railway Technology, which has been acknowledged through various national and international uh, awards. So, I would like to, at this stage, refer to two quotes. One from Rear Admiral Grace Hopper, who says, the most dangerous phrase in the language is, we've always done it this way. And another quote by Will Rogers, he says, even if you are on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. I think that is a, a quite an important um, point to make at this particular point in time to show that research and technology is very critical and using research and technology we can look at new opportunities, improve safety and allow for a revisiting of established practices. And that is critical in an environment that I established before for the 21st century of rail where we have shortage of human capital, we have quite a significant demand with new, new infrastructure coming on board. How do we do it better? How do we manage the rail infrastructure for the 21st century? Why are we doing things this way? We need to really question that. And this is the uh, topic that I would like to really tackle through this presentation. So take a take railway track. A railway track, if it is in poor condition, what happens? It increases the vehicle dynamics. It increases the track loading. It compounds into further geometry degradation and increased risk of vehicle derailment and reduced asset life, isn't it? In that case, how do we actually look at the railway track maintenance and management of this particular infrastructure? Initially, we will look at the design part of it, and then we monitor using looking at the track geometry or the rail profile, uh, GPR to look at the ballast condition, or CBR to look at the uh, bearing pressures of various layers within the track infrastructure. This is a typical way we have done for a long time. But in addition to that, what happens is there are significant other challenges coming into play, especially when you are monitoring or maintaining a uh, track infrastructure. There's a, a, a pressure to minimize the track position, minimize the staff on track, and increase safety protocols. It, this in addition to the remote infrastructure that we are building and railways normally run through various um, areas and the sheer um, kilometers of railway infrastructure that significant quantity of this um, um, track environment. The other challenges are confined spaces or inaccessible structure for example in the cutting here on the left uh, photo uh, on a um, where there's a, um, a culvert or uh, how do you maintain that one or a small um, 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 culvert again 
uh, how do you actually look at that uh, infrastructure? These are the challenges that we face. But what we really ignore in a general case in the past is railway is a system. Do we consider other factors when we are actually identifying when to do the maintenance, when to manage the railway infrastructure? Do we understand the system performance when we are managing the risk? And do we look at that overall cost if we don't do the maintenance at the correct time? What are the implications? Or if we do overdo it, what are the implications? Do we do look at it along those lines? Especially if you take the um, other component that is relevant is rolling stock, the quantity, the age difference, the different various parameters that need to be considered, especially when you're going to manage a track infrastructure. But that is generally not the approach that we take. So managing uh, independent components, which is a track or rolling stock independently, each component independently, it's ineffective. You don't really bring the holistic picture of the track infrastructure. So correlating components of deterioration, taking a system performance is quite critical. Therefore, the uh, monitoring that system performance is critical as well. And that is a quite an important aspect. Um, I couldn't really show you the video that I was planning to show, but um, because of this webinar uh, 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 platform, but um, you would remember uh, ABC 730 report in 2010, there's a typo here, 2010 in September 2010, which highlighted the problem with the track and how the drivers and the passengers on the train are feeling that particular effect. And therefore, that is a typical example that everyone knew and everyone know is a quite important aspect to cover. So how can we do this um, system approach? We have a, a track that we know there is a fault, track fault, and we know various operating conditions that we are operating, and we know that we have got different um, vehicles running over that particular track. So to manage that track, there are one way of doing it is trying to model. Once we know the track condition, if we are only looking at the track condition, once we know the track condition, we need to come up with a, a model that represents the track, and then we have to actually model a rolling stock which is going to run on top of that track and based on that track performance then we should we should be able to uh, come up with a, a limiting factor based on the vehicle performance for the track condition maintenance requirement wouldn't it be the way to do it and i think that is a a, a proper analysis should be done along that way otherwise why are we doing the track maintenance is to improve the vehicle performance the rolling stock which is running on top of it and the passengers or the load that are being carried by the rolling stock. That is the main reason for the track maintenance. So this is what I have highlighted in this particular slide where I have said that track is one component, then you need to know what is the vehicle which is running on top of it and the interfaces and the operating conditions before you set a limit on track geometry. But do we do that currently? Probably that is not the way most of the railways are managed. As far as I know, most of the track is looked at it as an isolated uh, component without even knowing what is going to run on top of that one. And we don't really change the track condition requirements based on the rolling stock which is running and with the age of the rolling stock and how we maintain the rolling stock. The other way of doing this particular um, uh, system approach is to measure. If we can measure the track condition and the operating environment, and in addition to that, the vehicle performance for that particular track condition, then we can say we can only put up with or we can only manage a certain amount of a vehicle uh, dynamic loading or that vehicle performance, and therefore we can set the track geometry limit. So that is another way of doing it if we don't want to go the modeling part where we just do the measurement of the track and then set limits based on modeled uh, infrastructure, uh, modeled uh, network, we can go and start collecting information at the same time from the track all the way to the rolling stock and the interactions 
and then we can start managing the railway that way. So that is what I have shown here. We cannot really manage a rail network, a component of the rail network, with only looking at it in isolation. If we are going to manage a track, we need to know the vehicles which are running on top of it, the operation and the interaction. If we know that particular um, holistic way of um, a railway system is operating, then we will can set our business objectives. Once we know that which business objectives, what we want to achieve, we can start looking at what data that we want to collect, how do we want to store it, and what sort of quality that data is coming through, and how can we can actually deduce some information which will be useful for our decision making to manage the railway network. And it's also important to know the relationship between the data set or the components. At this particular point, I would like to introduce a technology uh, that has been introduced for the uh, railway industry a few years ago called Instrumented Revenue Vehicle Technology, um, which you might have heard, you might have not heard, which is uh, automated structural health condition monitoring system um, using a normal revenue service, uh, whether it is a O car or passenger car, um, you utilize uh, uh, rolling stock to monitor the condition of the uh, track. This is one of the technologies uh, which has been uh, uh, um, quite useful and um, uh, as, a, uh, as a game changer for the uh, track maintenance um, uh, principles or approach. There are about 85 of these instrumented wa wagons have been installed and the main purpose of this particular uh, um, instrumentation technology is to uh, report a near real-time report uh, condition of the track and then rolling stock performance at the same time. So you're collecting data on the track and the rolling stock performance at the same time. And through this one, you can identify the effectiveness of maintenance activities. Just a little bit more on the instrumented revenue vehicle technology. It, has, it was in, introduced in 2002, mainly in the heavy haul area where there is significant demand for the track access and it is a technology which is very much um, developed for a uh, ruggedized railway environment and it is integrated into the normal operation. But now it has been utilized in various passenger networks as well and this do last um, uh, a dumping cycle of uh, through a dumper or um, various other ways of uh, um, heavy duty environment uh, which we are used to in the railways. This particular technology uses and measures, monitors vehicle track performance while moving passengers effectively. And um, to simply show a, a schematic diagram or quick uh, um, a system, it is a retrofitting uh, approach. It has been retrofitted into an existing um, coach or car uh, with various, um, various sensors, uh, pertinent locations to measure the information that is relevant for managing the railway network. And um, this system, what it does is it showed very uh, carefully in this particular uh, slide where it brings all the way from the track, down from the track running surface and track geometry, at the same time measures the bogey stability or bogey performance, wagon performance, and passenger comfort. So this is the technique that I mentioned before, the alternative for a, a modeling capable modeling approach where you measure one component and then model the rest of the performance to set the limitation. This is a, a way we can actually go forward or uh, measure uh, all the parameters and uh, limit those parameters uh, based on the measure, measured data that we collect. So compare this particular technique that I have highlighted to a, a traditional track geometry car, which we normally would um, uh, utilize for a track inspection. A uh, track geometry car is a, um, a de measuring device, a dedicated car, which would measure, uh, which would measure the continuously the, um, uh, the track condition. So for example, if you take an example, um, uh, 
uh, it um, a tractometrica uh, measures the running surface. Uh, it provides a GPS, altitude, vertical alignment, uh, lateral alignment, super elevation, twist, the gauge, curvature, all that are related to the track um, para uh, component. But what it misses is the vehicle response to that particular track condition. So if you take an example, um, a vehicle which is running over a, a, a same track, different vehicles will have a different responses. You need to really understand how that vehicle response for that particular track um, becomes for various uh, life cycle of that vehicle. One other thing is in a dedicated track geometry car, it requires a separate train path. And therefore, it is only utilized um, and not regularly. It's actually utilized um, once in uh, a month or once in three months or at a, a particular interval in between trains. And it doesn't measure with under normal vehicle loading. And therefore, there are uh, gaps between the data available. In risk, compared to that instrumented revenue vehicle, it measures the vehicle dynamic response to the track regularly, and it can measure during a normal traffic time, and therefore um, it can be run um, several times in a week or in a day, and measures uh, the load under um, under normal load that uh, rolling stock um, carries. So the important part, if any technology is introduced, I think if you had listened to the last um, one of the webinars, I think the risk of introducing new technology. When you introduce new technology, you have to validate. You have to make sure that the uh, technology is actually is not introducing another risk factor into the uh, into the um, industry or in, into the uh, operation. And this particular technology, even though it looks like um, quite a, um, uh, a move away from the traditional method, it, it is. Uh, moving away from the traditional method, uh, track geometry car, which is a, um, um, a 20 million plus uh, equipment, a dedicated car compared to a um, IRV track geometry, the data is quite uh, quite straightforward. So um, in this case, you can see that um, um, there are correlation is very close. If you take a super elevation twist or top east rail or top west rail. There is very, very close uh, when it comes to the data that has been collected. In addition to that, the instrumented revenue vehicle is capable of looking at things like the weld. Weld is generally uh, in the um, um, connect rail, uh, rail joint, and um, it has been an issue that um, uh, it, it has been an issue that has been um, coming through. Um, uh, in a various uh, new construction, rail weld with a, um, a particular uh, height, a dip or um, a dip or peak has, uh, will introduce a problem. And this is um, has been an issue. And uh, the capability of the IRV technology is during normal operation, you can measure the uh, rail longitudinal profile every five millimeters, and that provides a significant sampling of the weld, uh, which are in the order of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 millimeters. And that is the capability of the, the technology, which can provide information which is required by the rail, railway industry. Those who are involved in rail, um, track would know that rail well dip is a quite a important topic. And it has been a discussion point in various uh, forums. And we have had standards which have been developed for um, weld height of uh, more than a certain uh, level, like for example 0.4 millimeters or 0.3 millimeters or 0.2 millimeters weld deep or weld um, peak has been limited. And through this technology, what we have done is highlighted what is relevant. Is it the rail weld height, which is normally uh, in building, is expected to introduce some vertical acceleration or impact? The vertical impact, and that's why we are trying to limit the uh, the weld uh, dip or weld height. But we have managed to show this is what I meant at the start. I think thinking again, why are we doing this particular 
um, particular standard, why have we introduced this particular standard is to minimize the vertical acceleration and showed that cell height doesn't have a good correlation as you can see on the top right hand um, graph hasn't got a very good correlation with the um, high impact load whereas weld gradient has got a significant correlation with the vertical acceleration and that is the important aspect of it but in the past we didn't have the methodology to measure weld um, weld um, gradient weld uh, gradient were the critical part and that is the how it should be measured in the future and that would help the railways to manage it even better whether you are putting a um, 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 a um, short weld to replace a defect or building a new construction. This should be introduced and this has been in the forum uh, discussion uh, in various quarters including the new standards that has been um, currently being developed for weld rails, uh, welding of rails in Australia. This has been discussed as well. So you can see how the technology can help to improve the standards the way we manage the, to go forward rather than utilizing a certain traditional method which have certain limitations and has been utilizing uh, utilized in the past. So another um, capability that instrument of revenue vehicle has got is to measure dynamic track gauge. You know the gauge is the distance between two rails and in the past we used um, a static handheld uh, gauge measuring device or we use um, um, tachometry car to get the gauge but what we don't measure is under load we don't measure the, the uh, track gauge and the system that uh, has been developed which is to measure continuously using normal revenue vehicle during normal traffic hours to measure the dynamic track gauge and this has been um, uh, validated uh, against the um, standard uh, EN 13848 and the good part about this one is at 100 kilometers per hour um, 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 operation you can measure uh, the gauge uh, if you require every 150 millimeters if that is a requirement so this is just to show that two different package measurements using the instrumented revenue vehicle um, which you can actually get repeatability which is to the level more than what is expected from the engineering standard and also it has been validated against a track geometry car um, um, and show that the, um, uh, the variations are not significant until there are significant movement of rail um, and this is done regularly um, and collecting information. So other capability that has been introduced through this technology is to, uh, to collect rail profile. Again, the rail profile, those who have been involved in a railway know that there are several ways of collecting it, but the, one of the ways is to use a mini prop or uh, some accurate um, um, equipment to go and uh, get the uh, measurement. But using the uh, dynamic package measuring device in the uh, standard revenue vehicle, you can measure the uh, rail profile to the uh, to the accuracy of around 0.1 millimeters. So uh, you can see um, there are two um, uh, um, runs. The measure measured uh, rail profile under two runs, which shows on red and blue on the right hand graph, which is uh, over each other overlaid two different location which is um, shows um, the top is one location the second one is a second location and um, two runs are shown in each of those uh, graphs and that which shows that um, they are pretty much um, repeatable um, other thing is we have difference in uh, railway on a high rail and a low rail and we can start comparing uh, and understanding the railway Again, to under, get the rail where we uh, generally use um, uh, not a regular um, measuring devices. Uh, we collect that information um, at a particular time interval, but the capability is there now to regularly monitor to see any variations, any changes, 
during a per particular time or particular um, changes in the operations as well. So this instrumented wagon is not a device that you go and um, collect data manually. It is an automated measuring device, continuously measuring during the wagon uh, passages through the network. It is automatically transferred for uh, processing again automatically with a significant capability to report uh, uh, several different um, parameters as well as um, a trend over a period of time. To highlight, uh, the big data analytics is one particular uh, aspect that um, dominates the discussion when you start looking at um, um, data collection. A big data analytics is uh, regarded as a, a, a difficult task, but if you know what you're doing, it's a, quite a, um, you can find that, uh, um, you can actually bring the data together to create information that can be useful for a railway uh, to be managed effectively. Some railway operations uh, download up to 10 um, data sets um, or in a day, um, and that is equal to, equal, equal to about 25 gigabytes of post-process data per month. But this allows you to um, have an online reporting with a, a statistical accuracy so that you don't really collect data uh, once in three months or once in six months and then rely that everything else is extrapolated from that limited data set. Now you have got sufficient data to have a look at, as you can see in the last, uh, on the right hand bottom uh, graph, then you can start predicting and you can look at the trend of the deterioration of the track infrastructure. It highlights the location where uh, the high responses are coming through and um, you can actually start um, identifying and target where you want to go and do your maintenance um, uh, whenever you have the time interval but also it provides facility to provide near real-time feedback for operations to understand when a problem has come up uh, how to really resolve that particular problem as soon as um, it has been reported. So this is a feature of the instrumented uh, revenue vehicle where it is collected, collecting data during the revenue service and not disrupting any uh, traffic flow or throughput. So the, the facility allows you, due to that um, number of data that you collect, to understand the degrade, degrading location and the degrading rate of the uh, track infrastructure. To make the point that I made at the start, where track geometry changes the vehicle performance and the ride comfort. And this particular capability is shown in this particular, um, in this particular uh, slide, where you can see on the left-hand side, a track geometry de degradation at the same location, the ride comfort degradation. And this is the important aspect of it. So when you're doing the maintenance of the track, you're doing the maintenance because the ride comfort is getting um, significantly worse over a period of time. And it is, uh, once it hit the limit, you cannot really expect somebody to be sitting in that train and expect uh, that is acceptable. And there are standards which actually identify what is the ride comfort level should be. And therefore, that is a determining factor for the track geometry, not because track geometry limits are uh, vertical rail profiles are limited to a certain number on the standard. It's actually because of uh, right comfort or the consequence of that track geometry is um, in, um, putting onto the onto the system, and that is the important aspect of this particular system. So, if you look at it in a uh, um, uh, in a shallow way, you will say, "Oh, this is also measuring track geometry, and therefore, what is the difference between a um, track geometry car and an instrument wagon?" But the the difference is this can correlate to other parameters in the railway network to limit those uh, structural requirements of the track infrastructure. The, the second part is the maintenance effectiveness. A lot of times we go and do a maintenance of the uh, rail network and say that we have done the maintenance because we have approached 
particular location, done some activity, and therefore we have done the maintenance. But no time that we do a, a significant measurement of the effectiveness of that maintenance and what is the consequence after that maintenance over a period of time. Having data that is collected regularly, which allows you to understand when you have done the maintenance, which is shown here in red line, red vertical line, and when that maintenance has happened, what is the benefit of that maintenance on a um, parameter that matters. For example, if you do a grinding, why do you do the grinding? To remove the corrugation or the clean the rail surface. And what is the implication? It's vertical acceleration. So you measure the vertical acceleration to see the effectiveness of rail grinding. And that is how uh, this uh, measuring device is utilized by the railways to manage their rail network. The other part is also, sometimes when you do the maintenance, for whatever reason, there are detrimental effects. You put a well which is not really um, quite um, well um, um, situated, uh, the grinding or the welding operations didn't go according to plan, and that can create a significant impact. And that can be also identified and rectified as soon as possible. So that is another important aspect. And for a manager who is managing the whole rail network, you would like to know where are the um, hotspots in the network. So um, in this case, I've highlighted an um, area where, um, where uh, the full network, uh, the um, X graph shows uh, um, 30 uh, kilometers of track over a period of time, about um, um, uh, several months. And it shows any time you have done a maintenance, which is highlighted in a black dot, whether there is an improvement on the, um, the parameters that we are monitoring. So, for example, if you have done a uh, grinding, acceleration has gone up, or if you've done the tamping, the track uh, cross levels have improved. So, um, I think that is the uh, idea. So, when there's an improvement, it goes into a, a green uh, or a blue space. Uh, if it is um, quite um, a significant high uh, impact or high, um, uh, high numbers, it actually shows in red. So, you can see on your, the graph, uh, fully how to manage a rail network entirely and how do you actually cover the hotspots in your network. All this time I was talking about a near real-time um, reactive uh, maintenance. But the advantage is when you have sufficient data set to go into the predictive capability. I think the predictive capability is where I think uh, in the 21st century the significant gain will come rather than running from one end to the other end to really chase your own tail when you're doing the managing and maintaining your track, if you can predict your network, when things are going to get worse over a period of time, for that you need significant amount of data. If you have the data, regular data, statistically um, uh, confident data, then you can start predicting when the track is going to get to a level that you need to start doing the maintenance and start planning your maintenance. Obviously, there will be some locations where you need to do some reactive maintenance, but this is a predictive capability that I have uh, highlighted of the instrument wagon. But the most advantageous part comes from this point in uh, uh, point where you can identify where to do the maintenance, but do you know what maintenance to do? It? When you have a limited staff, limited trained personnel, what you need is you need a, a way of identifying what sort of maintenance would help based on the data that you have collected, based on your experience, so that you can utilize a system to identify where to go and what to do at that particular location. This is where the machine learning type of artificial intelligence activities will come in. I think at this point, I would like to just to take a couple of simple examples. Um, uh, one of my uh, colleagues highlighted recently, I think a simple um, 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 artificial intelligence uh, or machine learning exercise shows how uh, uh, iris, uh, three different types of iris are there. And if you want to identify a new um, plant that you have done some measurement, uh, whether, whether it's uh, type one, type two, or type three, how do you actually um, um, show that using some of the artificial intelligence or machine learning techniques? And for that, you need to know the parameters that are relevant so that you can actually start 
identifying in a particular category. That is important for railways as well. We cannot really take a, a machine learning um, um, data scientist and give him an exercise to say, go and find a problem uh, and find a solution based on the data set that we have provided. There is a domain knowledge is quite critical. And here it shows that petal length and petal width are the important aspects. And um, as you can see on the right top corner, uh, that actually separates three different types of uh, iris. And from this one, when you have a um, data, which is uh, orange or gold, uh, if you can see it, if you have a data, you can start using that parameter. You can identify what type of um, iris it is. Is it, it is iris petosa? And therefore, we can identify where to really uh, go and do what to do in that particular um, location. If we if I take a real example in this case. So machine learning is a quite an important aspect. And also to do machine learning, artificial intelligence, you need to have sufficient data. You need to know what is happening in the um, data set that you are utilizing. Again, another example from alcohol industry, I think to show um, if you take a uh, data set uh, taken every year or every two years, you cannot really come up with a trend for a future of uh, what is expected uh, for the sale. Um, again, um, if you know the data very closely, you can use the neural networks to understand how the data can be predicted for the years to come uh, based on the uh, past data, looking at the short term versus long term um, changes. So why I'm highlighting this is this is critical in railways. Because if you look at railway, if you um, take an uh, example um, in railways, we collect a lot of information, um, like other industries. And um, most of the time, we don't use that data for the analysis. Uh, we become uh, um, very uh, data rich, but um, we don't use that information to use our increasing our productivity. I think I understand that uh, from a presentation um, provided recently. I think um, uh, this is a 40% drop in people trying to do multitasking because people are not really uh, wired all the time to do multitasking. What we need is you, you train a machine to do that tasking, multitasking, and then uh, we provide our knowledge, the domain knowledge, into it. And therefore, we can utilize the data which is coming in to convert that into information that is useful for our for our industry. So uh, if you uh, look at uh, the railway industry at the moment, there are a lot of uh, data collected and a lot of uh, railway organizations are building their data warehouse. And still, the maintenance is largely reactive or cyclic. And we need to really understand something to un um, highlight from the data when there's a fault and how to really uh, sort that uh, uh, fault and the data analytics and the predictive models that has to be developed from there requires a domain experience. That is a critical part. If you are really going to um, um, go forward, the um, data identification and visualization is a quite an important part. I've just, in the next few slides, I'm just going to go through quickly because I'm running out of uh, time, but what I will do is highlight some of the important aspects of data. In this case, uh, visualization uh, platforms are uh, now becoming very useful. And uh, through that, um, now when you know a response of, uh, on a track uh, of a rolling stock, um, you need to uh, start looking at it, what is causing that particular response. And uh, data visualization using various techniques like uh, drones uh, would be one way of uh, looking at it. Because a um, lot of times when there is a need to go and inspect, you cannot send somebody because there are certain limitations due to bad weather or other disaster. So drones would be a, a, a typical technology that can be utilized in the uh, rail network to collect that information uh, to supplement some of the other information that you collect. But other important aspect with drone is you can create a um, um, digital model. Uh, you can actually create a, um, a model that um, a, a digital twin that can uh, start from uh, the railhead uh, to the entire structural network so that you can start looking at uh, varying 
changes over a period of time. So I would like to introduce this particular technology as a possible um, way of going forward. Uh, a recent example, which was highlighted in a heavy hall conference, it showed that in a Pilbara operation, in a uh, to do some cutting inspection, uh, which would normally take weeks, was completed within an hour, and with a digital twin created within days, which can be utilized for uh, various ways of uh, comparing uh, information over a period of time, um, uh, including looking at um, uh, digital elevation model to highlight the erosion, ballast shift and so and so forth. So this is one of the uh, um, uh, technology that is in, will be useful for the railway industry to manage the railway network and then of course passenger movement. Um, don't we have significant increase in passenger utilization? And again, uh, there are techniques, uh, various techniques that have been introduced, including um, CCTV and um, various Mikey cards and so and so forth to look at uh, data um, uh, passenger movement. But one of the other technology is using Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is a, a device that everyone uses regularly. And this is one technique that has been um, highlighted in one of the um, uh, railway stations in Victoria with uh, passenger consent, showing that about 96% of the passengers interested in the innovative technology to improve their utilization. So this is a technology which will it can provide a real-time understanding of where the people are moving and therefore the network can be managed very effectively using some of the new technologies in real time um, as well as looking at trends over a period of time. The advantage is improved safety, enhanced passenger experience and uh, in addition to that doing some modeling, uh, uh, network planning and analysis using information, correct information uh, compared to currently most of the information is uh, manually counted or through limited data. So to sum up the presentation, the important aspect for rail network is to shareholders to define what is their objective of when they are managing a railway, when they are uh, maintaining a railway, to measure the uh, important aspects which should provide that goal, the data which is required, and then validate that information that you are collecting, the data, that is accurate because if you are going to use um, uh, data which are not ac accurate, that is going to be a problem. So the black box approaches should be um, limited, whereas you need to really understand what data you are collecting, how it is validated, and question the validity of that data. Once that information is available, if you can build a data warehouse can, which can analyze and convert that data into information and build um, digital models and other tools to facilitate to drive your business decision. That is the important aspect of it. If you have that one, you can manage a rail network very effectively in the 21st century. So in summary, use the technological tools to continuously monitor a railway system performance. Once you have collected the data, then build models and tools to convert that data into useful information. That information should give you uh, a stepping stone if you can implement into your normal day-to-day uh, -day operation it will give you proactive evidence-based strategies to manage the rail network which will improve productivity throughput and reduce uh, risk and improve safety and of course the rail asset performance thank you very much That's great, Ravi. Thank you for uh, all that information. And as I'm sure everybody uh, watching along with us would agree, a lot of uh, a lot of great information there, and also a lot of great great slides. Uh, people, just uh, remind you, you can send your questions through. We've got ten minutes, and uh, Ravi, our first question here today is: um, Where are the 85 IRV deployed now? Are they all overseas, or some are, or are some in Australia? And if in Australia, are they only in Victoria? And are there any in New South Wales and in which fleet? <laughs> Quite an interesting question there, Robert. Um, I think the 85, there are a majority of them in Australia, um, uh, only very minority in Victoria. Um, the major um, uh, instrument wagons are operating in Pilbara operations in the Western Australia. There are some in New South Wales and some uh, were operating in Victoria. 
there are uh, some overseas places. Um, the notable one is in Hong Kong. Um, so um, in the passenger operation, and they've been uh, installed in uh, in other parts of the world as well. Great, thank you. Our next question, Ravi, is about track worlds. So if track worlds were perfectly profiled with no change in height or gradient, would the different metallurgical properties around the world affect vehicle performance? Uh, that is a, a very technical question. I think I would um, pass that to some of my colleagues at uh, Monash uh, if, uh, if we can get that um, question uh, in a uh, email, we can actually answer that. Uh, but uh, generally, I think uh, even though uh, it is perfectly profiled, but a lot of times, I think when we start uh, measuring it, it doesn't show that way. So um, that is the important aspect that I want to cover here. But the uh, different metallurgical properties around uh, vehicle performance, uh, it is a um, quite an interesting area to tackle. And I will um, take that question on notice and uh, get one of my colleagues to answer. Okay, no, thank you for that. We can we can certainly follow that up here at our end. Uh, the next one is around uh, the network. So, how would you assess Ravi Australia's network and track operators' proactiveness in managing their networks? <laughs> that is a loaded question. I think. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I would say that um, if you take uh, Australian railway, the heavy haul is regarded as the benchmark railway in the world. And a lot of times we don't really highlight that part. Um, when uh, anyone asks how is your railway rated in the world, we straight away think of passenger network. But if you take the um, uh, operations, the heavy haul operations, they are very proactive and that's why they have hit the benchmark um, status. So I would say, I think um, I would rate very highly our um, heavy haul operations. Okay, great. So, Rami, what um, you were talking earlier about time frames. So, what time frames are you talking about in preparing predictive maintenance programs from using information from the data you have collected? Uh, what sort of program time frame would this be? And do you have an example of implementation? So, so the predictive maintenance is um, it's nothing new. I think in the past, the predictive maintenance is called cyclic maintenance, where people say, I think uh, we think that it will happen at this time, and therefore we'll do the maintenance, but without any evidence-based data. It's actually based on some other experience or some other uh, notion of what should be done or the experience gained from another system. What we are uh, um, highlighting here is you utilize your own data on your own operation to do the predictive maintenance. And um, again, I think um, if I may, uh, again, heavy haul operations, uh, that's how they actually utilize some of the data that they're collecting on the instrument of wagon to predict their maintenance based on the uh, performance of the track and the experience that they have. So I highlighted before the domain, domain knowledge or uh, subject matter expertise is a quite an important aspect. So I'm not arguing here that it will replace this techniques and technologies will replace people. In fact, it will increase the value of some of these people because that knowledge has to be passed on to a machine that can provide that information and the systems can provide you the tool to do the predictive maintenance. So um, it is currently uh, being done. Um, the capabilities there, there are uh, several railways are utilizing uh, this information for that purpose, uh, for predictive maintenance. And not only just using the track uh, data to do the predictive maintenance, they are using the relationship between the track data with vehicle performance and the rolling uh, the passengers or uh, loads which are on the on the rolling stock to do the predictive maintenance of another component. So that is a quite a advanced way of looking at it. Okay, excellent. Uh, the next one, uh, Ravi, is around late legacy issues in our rail network. Um, the question is, uh, there are a range of legacy issues in rail between our states. Um, what practical approaches can be applied to improve interoperability? Um, so that is a little bit um, 
little bit uh, different to what I was covering, but if a rolling stock is running through that network, that means the same rolling stock will be covering through various different track networks. And we can start comparing the capability. It's not um, a fault of the track. It's actually fault of the interaction between the rolling stock and the track. So the, in, the important part is to understand the uh, relationship between the rolling stock performance on a particular type of track and then do the maintenance. Therefore, one particular um, um, uh, track maintenance strategy might not be a straight, a straight away carried over to another uh, network, which has got a totally different uh, rolling stock, along with the common rolling stock. You cannot really utilize the same approach. That's why a lot of times there's a uh, debate when a, um, when a passenger uh, vehicle runs over a particular network and a, um, a loaded uh, cargo or loaded um, frame uh, lo goes, there are different aspects and different responses are measured. And it is important to know which one are you, if they are dominant, uh, one, how conservative your organization is and how do you want to maintain your track infrastructure. Uh, for the passenger network or for the uh, freight operations. You need to really understand the whole uh, dynamic before you can actually set a parameter. So this is a quite another uh, interesting topic to uh, think of when you have a mixed traffic or when you are um, uh, running through various different um, you know, um, states, how do you uh, look after the network for the particular rolling stock? So this is a point that I was highlighting from the start, that understanding the inter, uh, interrelationship is quite important before when you are doing, a, um, uh, doing maintenance and management. That's great, thank you. So the next one, next question is around challenges. So are there any challenges with privacy and, and personal concerns when maintaining passengers on platforms and coming from passenger trains? Again, I think, um, um, although we all worry about our uh, personal um, privacy, uh, there are uh, currently uh, we, we know there are so many cameras and um, so many ways of uh, collecting information. It is a concern, especially in a uh, environment that we live in. Um, we are uh, quite uh, concerned about it. The technology that I was highlighting before was a um, anonymized technology, so therefore you don't really collect private information, you only collect information which is anonymized and you know uh, there is a device is there, you are not really tracking that device is belong to Joe Blog and really uh, looking at his uh, operating patterns, you are uh, collecting that information to provide sufficient information so that you can manage the um, track, uh, sorry, the platform uh, effectively so that you are not pushing too many people onto the track and into the track or if you are trying to do some planning, rather than a, um, a person counting number of people uh, once in every six months and uh, start planning your network according to that, we are utilizing information during a uh, valid data collection process. So I think the privacy is quite important, uh, but in this case, what I highlighted there is a, a anonymized technology, which is uh, totally doesn't really link up uh, privacy concerns, and that is. That was highlighted through an ethical study at Monash when we did that trial uh, in Melbourne, uh, which I uh, highlighted in that presentation. Okay, I might just squeeze in, we're almost at time, I'll just squeeze in one more question. Uh, there are so many variables which could impact the monitoring software, including weather conditions and the way they are operated by the driver system. How can the, how can the equipped rolling stock also monitor these factors? Well, I think if there are factors that are going to uh, um, matter the data, that's, that has to be collected. I think at the end of the day, it's important that you collect the information that are relevant. Uh, that's why I mentioned about the domain knowledge is quite important. If there are factors like driver, um, uh, driver strategy or uh, weather condition uh, or uh, various other factors, uh, rain, humidity, uh, change in the tr uh, track uh, condition, you need to collect that information, and that data doesn't have to be collected just through the instrumental wagon. There are there are so many various ways of collecting that information, which can be fed into a, uh, the model that I was talking about when you are doing the prediction uh, capability or managing capability. So the important aspect is the 
a data warehouse when you're building it, bringing the correct data. And when you're doing the uh, machine learning um, um, algorithm, bring those data set. Otherwise, what will happen is you are missing some of the information which are relevant for the decision making. So that is critical uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the planning process. Yes. That's great. Well, Ravi, we are um, unfortunately out of time. So I'd like to thank you today uh, for your time uh, for presenting and also thanking everybody who's participated today in, in watching your presentation and engaging with the Q&A session. Uh, just a reminder to everybody that uh, we will send out an email in the next couple of days where you can download the uh, presentation and watch it again if you wish to do so. Um, a short feedback survey will also be circulated and I encourage you to, com to complete that. Uh, please join us next Wednesday when Dr. Polly McGee, Director of Pilot Light, will present part three of Dare to Lead, uh, Braving Trust. Uh, once again, thank you to Ravi and to all participants for today and we look forward to seeing you again next Wednesday. Bye-bye. Thank you, Robert.